And then the question is, how are we going to write history? My suggestion in this talk, um, before I forget, is that we have to learn to write about the past without multiplying probabilities, without saying, well, she might have, and she could have, she would have, and then you add might have with would have, you multiply it by must have, and then you get anywhere you want. And that's what I see happening in the story of development of these scientific myths. The story of Franklin's kite is the following. Um, in, um, of course, you all know the story. Um, in 1952, he flies a kite in Philadelphia and finds that lightning is the same thing as electricity. In many of these images, he's portrayed with his son. There he is again, dangerously, courageously, almost casually risking his life. <laughs> Lightning happened to be just five millimeters away from my kite, but I'm not afraid. <laughs> it's just another day out in the park while my son just sits by and watches me kill myself. <laughs> Founding fathers. There he is again. Um, the story has the shape of a classic myth, the story of Prometheus. The story of Prometheus as told to us by Hesiod since the 8th century before Christ. Um, Prometheus stole fire from the god of thunder and um, he used a, a long stalk of fennel to steal it and bring it back to mankind. Um, here it is again. Uh, stealing the, the fire from the gods, the fire from the thundering sky. The story of Franklin, similarly, is um, uh, using a long string, Franklin stole what he called the electrical fire from the thundering sky. So there he is in a famous painting by Benjamin West, 1816, accompanied by some uh, angels. <laughs> Um, it looks like a really large, imposing painting. It's actually quite small. And here it is, stealing God's thunder. So this, the, it's, it's as though in our minds, there is something that really resonates about this. The people of the time, soon after Franklin actually reported what he had done, literally compared him to Prometheus and called him the new Prometheus. Now, here are the problems. What Franklin describes is the following. Um, the, the sequence of events is as follows. In May 1752, at marly la ville France, a group of people uh, led by a guy called Thomas Dalibard carry out an experiment that Franklin had suggested, which is if you can set up a large iron rod somehow insulated from the ground, if electricity is electrical, then maybe there, I mean, if lightning is electrical, then there's electricity in the cloud, electricity in the air, and the air should transmit electricity to the rod, and thus you will get the birth of lightning rods. Um, Franklin had designed the experiment, but he had not been able to carry it out. So before he carries it out, a group following his descriptions carries this out in France. They erect a 40-foot iron rod insulated from the ground, and when a cloud passes overhead, they touch the rod and feel that it has been electrified. So there it is, not done by Franklin, the discovery that electricity is in the thundering clouds. Darwin knows this. I mean, I'm sorry, Franklin knows this. In August of 1752, that same year, Ben Franklin's own newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette, publishes a summary of the experiment at marly la ville France. He makes no comment about he himself having done anything remotely comparable to that. In October of 1752, essentially some four or five months after the marly la uh, experiment, Franklin publishes in his own newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette, an account. He says, those of you who know that something interesting has been done in France, you might be interested in knowing that something similarly interesting has happened here in Philadelphia. He doesn't say, I did it. But he said, what you should do is take a handkerchief, put it on a couple of twigs, put a little metal uh, antenna at the end of it, fly it out like a kite, and after you fly with a kite, you've got it flying with a kite, you connect a little um, uh, uh, a ribbon of silk to the kite, to the string, so that if, if you gather electricity, the electricity is not transmitted down to you, the, the string
an insulator. And then um, before the thing, you're going to hang a key, a metal key, that's going to gather this electricity. And if you touch this, you're going to feel electricity. Now, there are several problems with this account. Um, he says that you should fly a handkerchief. Those of you who might try to do that later today <laughs> will find that the problem is that handkerchiefs are too small, so they don't elevate very high. The TV show Mythbusters try to do this, they just can't get the thing to elevate. What makes a kite elevate is the size, because the size of the kite has to lift the weight of the string. So he also says that he did this in the rain. Because he believes, of course, that water conducts electricity very well. So the, the string should be wet. To wet the string, he proposes, Benjamin Franklin, that you have to fly your kite in the rain. How do you elevate a handkerchief kite in the rain? I don't know. And you have to do this without getting the silk ribbon wet. How do you prevent the silk ribbon from being wet? Well, of course, he says you do it from inside a house. How do you elevate a kite in the rain from inside a house with a handkerchief? <laughs> it's a serious problem. And he says, well, he says, a window or doorway, which is what we see in that picture. He said, well, maybe in a doorway. Maybe if I elevate the, the kite before it starts, starts raining, run into the house, then the rain starts, hopefully it, hopefully it can all come together. <laughs> um, hopefully it can all come together. The problem is that Franklin's report is vague. I'm not saying he didn't do this. I'm saying this is painfully vague. Um, you do not play with lightning. Um, it's not a casual thing. The dangers of lightning are terribly horrifying. Uh, lightning is uh, about 50,000 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, five times hotter than the surface of the sun. Um, it travels for five miles going down 25,000 feet at a speed of 50,000 miles per second with force enough to split a tree, heat enough to, 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 to melt an iron rod and fuse silica sand into glass. Benjamin Franklin himself has reported in his Pennsylvania Vania Gazette before flying his own kite about the horrors of lightning, how it split a woman's face, how it burnt the image of a tree onto a man's chest, he says, and all kinds of horrible, uh, deathly things, just because he finds it interesting. Um, the, the question is, why would Ben Franklin lie? After all, Franklin is a nice guy, and we all like him. I like Ben Franklin. I would have him at my house as well. <laughs> Before, before, he found, before he flew the kite, he had founded a library, um, he invented the lightning rod, he operated a newspaper, he worked against counterfeiting, he funded the Academy and College uh, of Philadelphia, he helped to establish the Pennsylvania Hospital, he was elected to the Pennsylvania Assembly, he was Justice of the Peace for Philadelphia. That's a pretty nice resume. But he was also very good at hoaxes. In his own newspaper, he published accounts such as um, a plain truth account of a Scottish Presbyterian that wished to incite military actions. He made it up. Um, he self-published an almanac in uh, 1732 that predicted the death of a, of a real almanac editor. He uh, published a story in 19, 1747 about Puritans who put a woman on trial for the crime of having too many children out of wedlock, and she claimed that she was following her, her God-given duty. Um, the story was so successful, it was widely discussed in Europe and America, and only 22 years did Darwin admit, it, I mean, did Franklin admit that it was a hoax. He also published other fake messages from a Jesuit, the King of Prussia, a Muslim who was in favor of slavery, and a story about how flies come back to life when you submerge them in wine. <laughs> so, looking at this, um, 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 in the early, in, in the 1750s, some people began to complain. Some people promptly wrote and said, Franklin, uh, my friend, 
I hope that you will publish something more exhaustive than the superficial account that you just published, because you know this is scientific work that requires more elaboration than a lowly newspaper. Franklin didn't elaborate it any further. Um, uh, a fellow Jack de Roma, who carried out a similar experiment in 1753, found out that Franklin had done the same thing allegedly in 1752, wrote him a letter explaining how did you do it. Franklin uh, replied that he would reply later, and then he never did. And de Roma had to go simultaneously. I mean, he said he would do this the year before. He carried it out in 1753. He had a, no a number of witnesses. It was very complicated. It was very horrifying. He described everything from the, the length of the string, what he had to do to actually get it to, to work, to thread a copper wire up the string, um, the, the, the sounds that the crackling make, the smells, the duration, um, the, the effects, the visual effects of the, the, the kinds of things that are necessary if you're trying to do this yourself. Because if ever an experiment required detailed descriptions, this is it. As writer Tom Tucker rightly argued, in this case, you are risking your life and every word counts. Franklin just didn't reply to such people who had further inquiries. Instead, he wrote open statements in his Pennsylvania Gazette, such as, hey, if anybody knows anything about the many properties of lightning, uh, please uh, email it, uh, uh, write it to us, because we're very interested. <laughs> That's what he did. And, um, and um, um, Franklin became accused by the Paris Academy of Sciences that he had faked his report, and that if he had evidence, he should come forward to defend his claim. This was by the Abbé Jean Nollet, who was prominent in France as an expo exposer of electrical frauds throughout Europe. He was, he was Franklin's nemesis. Franklin did not feel too inc inclined to respond, said nothing. And the committee said that priority should be awarded to Jacques de Romain for actually doing the experiment unless Franklin or anyone else provides evidence. The evidence only came in 1767, 15 years after the alleged events. When Joseph Priestley, writing the book, The History and Present State of Electricity, included a few sentences about Franklin's experiment, which he says he received from Franklin himself. He says that Franklin flew the kite in June of 1752. June. The people in France did their experiment in May. Franklin allegedly flew the kite in June. He reported the experiment of France in August, said nothing of his home, and then in October, he reported his own. That, that is a perplexing chronology. It says that, that he did it in June, that there was a witness, his son William. His son William never went on record saying whether he saw Franklin do anything with any kite. Um, and also that the experiment was carried out in a field under a shed. Again, not enough details in case you want the experiments to act, the, 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 the information to actually carry out the experiment. Um, Nevertheless, Priestley and Franklin were quite convincing. A Harvard historian of science, uh, I.B. Cohen, uh, extensive scholar on Benjamin Franklin, agreed that, um, that the evidence shows that Franklin did do this. Now, when I.B. Cohen wrote this in 1952, it being the 200th anniversary of the alleged event, Cohen Having used a plethora of conjectures, he admitted that several more were implicit. He wrote, I am fully aware that many more statements in this article should contain such words such as, very likely, possibly, may well have, etc. <laughs> By contrast, I have used, what I've done is I have used no such speculative conjectures. So my answer to did Franklin fly, fly the kite is I don't know. There is not enough evidence to say that he did, and what he says is just, uh, is, is just not compelling, that, that, it, that it describes an event that happened. In fact, when you read the report of 1752, you are oddly surprised to see that what he says is mainly prescriptive. He says this is something that you can easily do, do and he says it has been done in Philadelphia. At no point does he say, I did it. Does not say that. So. The bottom line, as I said, is that um, the, the danger in writing history is that we multiply conjecture upon conjecture and feel that it is our job as an investigator to essentially figure out the past. Um, 
the, the, the alleged reason for doing that is that maybe we think that history is poor, that in itself it doesn't have enough. But it does. History has enough wonderful, interesting things, astonishing stories of success against unlikely odds that we can tell.